which is a bit unusual. But again, whether people join, we wait, we wait to see. Yeah, right. Mm. What sort of comments? <laughs> ah, okay. A um, uh, couple of comments about Noel Ferrier. Ah. <laughs> Who they were very impressed by. Well, let's see. Um, <clears throat> do much. No, well, and uh, about Michael Long, who impressed other people. So, oh, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, uh, not sorry, Michael Long is, um, yeah, plays uh, Hugh Prentice. Yeah. Not very uh, thought his uh, performance. <laughs> Play, play, can you remind me who plays uh, Michael Long, who, who he plays? No, Michael Long played Hugh Prentice. Oh, okay. Yeah. We see the security guy, the um, the protocol guy. Forget now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I thought I should comment. Noel Ferrio is quoted as saying that his performance, with, along with Slim de Grey's, was unintentionally hysterical. <laughs> <Good one. laughs> so Slim de Grey, remind me who Slim de Grey was. Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister. Yes. Oh, yes, mm. right. Now, what struck me about Noel Ferrier was um, this is before John Kerr, but he looks awfully like John Kerr. Yeah, yes. yes. I agree. Yes, yes, I agree yes, with that. Yes, yes, I think so too. Yeah. And yes. the acting was like it. Too. <laughs> yeah. This is before John Kerr was even, you know, appointed Governor General. Very yeah. prescient. Yeah, very mm. prescient. Look, we might as well make a start. I think um, other people Where's join with. Where's Ray gone? I'm here. Oh, well, we can't see. <laughs> go, go to gallery view, Tony. Gallery Up view. Top right, where it says view. View. We don't have view on this one. Yes, it does. There, where? Just there. And oh. go to go to gallery view, and yes. you'll you'll see more people. Oh, I see. Oh, goodness me, that's frightening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still fitting on one page. Yeah. Well, we might make a start. So, Peter, over to you, uh, and then you're going to bring Tony in a bit later on. Yes, I will. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to be able to uh, talk about uh, this film, which uh, may not be the greatest film ever made in Australia, but uh, Demonstrator certainly is a rarity amongst uh, films uh, in Australia, being uh, that it dealt with political issues, which Australian filmmakers are very reluctant to deal with for whatever reason, perhaps they're not commercial enough. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the background of the film. So, I mean, some of you have already probably read about this, but just to give the film context, first of all, as it was uh, shot in 1970. In the late 1960s uh, in Australia, some films were being made, some uh, low budget uh, Australian films, as well as some featuring international stars who were flown in to uh, make the films more palatable to overseas audiences. But uh, I'm sure we all remember there a weird mob, um, which uh, from the late 60s, Age of Consent, which of course uh, Tony was involved with. We'll talk about that a bit later. Color Me Dead, which uh, was a, a Reg Goldsworthy production, which uh, um, Warwick Freeman uh, was sort of involved with, but we can talk about that a bit later. Um, the Set, which is a, a, a remarkable film, which has now been restored and released on DVD. Uh, 2000 weeks and I think a, a pretty trailblazing film for the late 60s in Australia was You Can't See Around Corners. You might remember that because it dealt with issues that uh, uh, about um, romance and life in Australia and uh, family issues which predated of course uh, television uh, hooking on to that much later in, in terms of number 96 and all of those sorts of shows. But that's another story. Now, in America, in terms of protest films and so on, I mean, we had Woodstock, of course, which you could say is the ultimate uh, protest film. Um, you had Medium Cool, Haskell Wexler's film uh, from the late 60s, and Getting Straight, which uh, dealt with uh, uprising of students. And probably the most important one of that era, which dovetails in with uh, the demonstrator is the Strawberry Statement, Stuart Hageman's film, 
which uh, we might talk a bit more about a bit later on. But uh, uh, if you ever get a chance to see it, Warner Archive have now uh, released the film, um, The Strawberry Statement. It's, it's worth having a look. But we're here to talk about Demonstrator. So Demonstrator uh, is sort of the... Uh, the origins of Demonstrator go back to David Bryce and uh, James Fishburne, uh, who were the producers of the film. Bryce was a newsreader at uh, CTC7 in Canberra, and he optioned a book written by Don and Elizabeth Campbell, which uh, again was a rarity in Australian novel writing as well at that time, uh, dealing with political issues about uh, a, a possible future because it was set in the immediate future, about uh, Australia being involved in negotiations and, and issues related to defence and, uh, and protecting uh, borders and all that sort of thing. How remarkably prescient was that novel? <laughs> so Demonstrator um, sort of picked up on that. Um, so uh, it was then decided that uh, Warwick Freeman, um, who had done a lot of television but hadn't really um, directed a feature film, would be appropriate to uh, uh, direct uh, Demonstrator. Funding uh, was an interesting one because it was done by local uh, businessmen, by ACT solicitors. Uh, so eventually, and, and in fact, uh, it was the case that Freeman each night had to go to dinners to cajole businessmen to, uh, and it was men, uh, unfortunately, no women really at that time. Uh, involved to invest uh, eventually the $300,000 that uh, was the budget for um, Demonstrator. Um, one of the decisions that was made early was to import uh, an overseas actor um, to uh, be the uh, uh, the chief, uh, not not the chief negotiator, but to be a part of the uh, negotiations of uh, this uh, defence uh, alliance. Um, which became the source of a protest in, uh, in Demonstrator. Uh, Kenneth Tang, um, who had made a, a number of Chinese films, had been in uh, Chinese films since 1955. And interesting to note, uh, he's now 85 years of age, has received uh, a, a number of uh, uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards and has over 200 acting credits to his name. But in 1970, he, of course, was not terribly well known, but it was thought that he was from Hong Kong. It would uh, be appropriate to have a, a Chinese face or an Asian face, although it's never clear what country he represents in the film uh, Demonstrator. Uh, it was important to have someone with some international kudos uh, attached to him. Um, and of course, there's other casting, which I'll come back to. Now, the film was shot over six weeks, three weeks in Canberra, uh, using various locations, the Academy of uh, uh, Science, um, the uh, Canberra Theatre Centre, the Fairburn, uh, Fairburn Army Base. Um, so they used some good Canberra locations uh, in the film, but three weeks of the film was shot uh, in Sydney. And if you remember, if you've had a look at the film recently, the film starts off with Kenneth Tsang in the Sydney fish markets. Um, so uh, it, it's interesting that it doesn't start in Canberra. Um, and also um, uh, some of the interiors, uh, studio shots, were shot in Sydney as well uh, in a studio there. So here we are, there's Freeman, first time film, uh, film director, uh, shooting a film. Uh, everyone was pretty much flying blind on this occasion. They, uh, they didn't have uh, massive templates or uh, background to be able to, to make the film. They knew they had a, a reasonably good story, which Kit Denton um, adapted from the, uh, uh, the novel. And of course, Kit Denton went on to uh, write Breaker Morant. And is of course the father of Andrew Denton. But uh, so Kit Denton was uh, uh, reasonably well known at the time and wrote the screenplay. Um, so uh, also commissioned for the film was Bob Beatles Young, who's well known in the music industry uh, at the time. And he wrote the score as well as the two songs 
that feature in the film. And of course, films in the late 60s, early 70s in particular, especially in the US, had to have a theme song, had to have something to, uh, to make it, uh, again, palatable for the audience. But of course, what made the film extremely palatable for the audience, they thought, was to have lots of sex scenes, nudity, uh, car chases, romps. Um, you've got to have those, otherwise you can't sell a film. Um, so hence the politics was uh, <laughs> became sort of second nature to the <laughs> original <laughs> uh, original intent of the uh, uh, of the producers, and in particular Columbia Pictures, who uh, distributed the film in America and overseas, and I'll get Tony to talk about that shortly because they uh, they completely hacked the film. But we'll talk about that a bit later, um, and I'll ask Tony to talk about it. So. Here we are, we have this six week shot, uh, uh, shoot, and uh, it was a rare attempt to try and deal with politics, how Australia fits into the uh, Asian region, Southeast Asia, and uh, whether uh, there should be some sort of defense alliance. Of course, students will resent that. Uh, that was the premise behind the story and that students will protest that uh, this is not appropriate, this enhances uh, military uh, involvement of Australia in the Southeast Asian region, and so it has to be stopped. Although I must say that the whole thing seems a little muddled in terms of what the, the actual <laughs> politics <laughs> is, but that was the sort of intent. And so we had uh, a situation where the Defence Minister, uh, played by Joe James, had a son, Gerald Maguire, who uh, is a journalist uh, in the film, um, but uh, gravitates towards the students who were um, forming protests against this meeting that was going to be held to forge this alliance uh, under the behest of the uh, Prime Minister, played by Slim de Grey. Um, an interesting aside is that John Gorton did not want to appear in the film. He, of course, was Prime Minister at the time, but uh, Slim de Grey was made up to look a little bit like John Gorton and, uh, and so there was a sort of um, uh, a relationship there if we're talking also about Noel Ferrier and whether he looks <laughs> like the uh, Governor General elect later on. Um, um, but um, what is interesting to note is that Gorton did help the film and did uh, so, uh, assist with the RAAF who uh, supplied uh, vehicles and uh, and uh, a plane and the uh, Defence Force base. Um, so there was some cooperation um, by uh, John Gordon there at the time. Of course, there was no film industry as such. And also ANU, uh, the Australian National University supplied most of the extras who were protesters uh, who could be seen in the three major <laughs> protests that uh, occur throughout the film. Now, it's interesting going back to the, uh, the uh, Defence Minister's son, Gerald Maguire, and how he gravitates towards the protesters. Uh, the film sets up, of course, this familial argument of father-son uh, disengagement, uh, and of course, um, exacerbates that um, uh, considerably throughout the film. And, and that somewhat distracts perhaps a little bit from the, the, the kernel of the story. But uh, nevertheless, the film had to be, um, how should we say, entertaining for the audience and politics, obviously, is not deemed to be particularly entertaining. Uh, hence, uh, the, uh, the nudity and sex scenes, which are sometimes quite hilarious. Uh, it, it was great to see um, Noel Ferrier <laughs> playing the Governor General. And he does it in such a great way because he was so restrained. He, uh, he did not overact at all. He was just there. He was calm and quiet as mayhem uh, occurred around him. And, and so um, he should have been nominated for a, a Best Acting Award, I thought, but he seemed to have been neglected by the AFI at the time. I don't know why. It seems so unfair. Okay, so here we have this film that was shot uh, in the six weeks. It was uh, brought in on budget. Um, and the director of photography, John McLean, uh, was hired to uh, make the film look good. And he certainly had some good shots of Canberra in particular at the time. Um, but 
who was brought in to edit the film? Tony Buckley. And Tony, I'm now going to pass this over to you. I've got a lot more to say later, but Tony, I want you to comment on your the process because this was between, for you, Age of Consent and Wake in Fright, wasn't it? Um, yeah, so I came from Wake in Fright, editing Wake in Fright to the demonstrator <laughs> and wondered what on earth hit me. Um, <laughs> Uh, you would have to admit your statement about demonstrator being muddled uh, a few minutes ago it would be the film understatement of all time. Um, yes, you had to have a car chase and you had to have a nude love scene, which is so embarrassing to watch. Um, and the car chase, the car chase surprised me the other night when I looked at the film again. I thought, I don't remember even doing it. Um, um, the film, uh, you tend to make it sound much better than it is, in my view. Um, on the first day of rushes of any picture, um, you know when you've got an A film or a B film. A B film, not being B grade, a B film, which is a six-reeler that goes on in the first half of the program. When we saw the rushes for the first night, my assistant editor, Warwick Herkes, who could never stop laughing, singing the daddy rushes, um, we realised we had a C film. <laughs> uh, and, and, and this was really troublesome to me as an editor because having come from an intense cutting experience on Wake and Pride to demonstrate a, which was lacking in coverage, you can't edit a film when there's no coverage. So they prompt the camera up, took a master shot, and that was it. So that made it doubly difficult. Um, um, we had to also contend with the music track of the Strawberry Statement, which was played endlessly every night in the motel uh, as Warwick prepared his shots for the next day shooting. Strawberry Statement influenced him a lot, and I've mentioned it here that it's now available on archive. Uh, records, uh, CDs from uh, Warners. Um, Columbia, you said, hacked into the film. <laughs> um, you've got to remember, Columbia was still getting over the shock of a naked Helen Mirren <laughs> in Age of Consent, which we had to replace all the close-ups of Helen, and she did her own underwater stuff. We had to replace them all with wide shots. So the close-ups of Helen had been emasculated by Columbia some two years beforehand. So when the demonstrator arrived at Culver City, they must have had a stroke because <laughs> the film is muddled, as you so rightly say. Uh, um, the editing process was an interesting one because on the night of its opening in Sydney, which was its world premiere, I think. No, it had a world premiere in Camp and then it opened in Sydney. The projectionist was waiting in the foyer of the theatre for me because oh, Warwick was upstairs in the projection box, still wanting to take scenes out of the film. <laughs> and the print was already on the projectionist. <laughs> um, and it was a less than salubrious theatre of the town on the corner of Pitt and Park Street. Um, but also, you mentioned financing. In editing the film back into Sydney, Warwick would have to suddenly leave and go to lunch or dinner and try and raise the rest of the money for the film because the film didn't have all the money. Act One had failed to do the funding. And the relationship between James Fishburne and Warwick with Act One became disastrous. It was amazing the film got finished. There's an interesting note here of our inferiority complex of a, 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 an industry that was still yet to emerge. We'd had there a weird mob, we'd had Age of Consent, we'd had Adam's Woman, and then the two great films of 1971, Walk About and Wake in Pride. So, but what people happen to realise, the demonstrator, even though it had no money, went to Glen Glen in Hollywood to be mixed. And it was there where Ron Purvis had then established, or had already established United Sound in Sydney, uh, learned so much. And Warren Freeman, when he screened the film, I think, at Acme in Melbourne in 2008, 
see that there was the greatest learning curve just the four days in Hollywood, which is all they could afford to mix demonstrator. But yes, um, Columbia acted too. But, but the Americans do that with all films, even with Ken Hall film Smithy, that became Pacific Adventure and lost 20 minutes of the story, you know. So uh, it's good that we've got a very badly scratched printer demonstrator here. But um, I suppose to be fair to the film, which I think is basically a mediocre film by the standards of the films we've just been talking about, but it's a brave film because no one was making contemporary Australian cinema at the time themselves. So that uh, gives a big tick. And uh, Warwick uh, was disappointed. It was a commercial and critical failure. And you can see why when you study the film. Some scenes work, but mostly it's lacking energy. And you can't put energy into a film if you don't have coverage. <clears throat> and and uh, Tony, then the editing <clears throat> process, how did that work for you on a day-to-day -day basis? Because would you have been able to communicate back to Warwick that uh, he needed to uh, shoot some more scenes or, or to have more coverage or to do more with the film so that you have something really good to edit? The question is fair, but <clears throat> at the time, um, I think Warwick, was, was, without uh, being uh, mean, I think Warwick saw a different film every night at Russia's than we did. Um, he, he couldn't see that he needed cutaways. He couldn't see he needed a close-up. But then, in fairness, the first assistant director and the cameraman, John McLean, they would tell him, we haven't got the time to shoot anymore. We haven't got the time. And a setup takes the best part of 20 minutes on any film. And we didn't have all those 20 minutes to spare every day, six weeks shoot. And we look at the car crash and, and the, uh, the student demonstration at the Albert Hall. Mm. They're big setups and they take time. But there wasn't the time then to do the, what we call the pickup shots, the close ups. Mm. Uh, so that's why I think the editing of the film is what I describe as lazy, and, and except for when we get the car chase and the other things where you had the material to cut and double up on shots. Um, but I suppose looking back, um, I, I'm saddened that the archive have only got a very badly scratched 16 millimeter print. Mm. You should be looking at it in 16 millimeter, folks. It's a widescreen film. And you can't see it in 185 to 1. I don't know what they screened in Melbourne in 2008. I'd like to know. Um, but there's, there's a, an unfortunate culture at the NFSA about film, which I've never been able to quite fathom. Uh, I did a screening there about five years ago. For, I, I chose deliberately three 35 millimeter shorts on widescreen to give the, to remind people what widescreen was about. And all I could produce was three scratch 16 millimeter prints. Mm. And I would appeal to the archive and to Jan Muller, particularly having seen this example of demonstrator, that please have an inquiry as to why you've got so many 16 millimeter prints when the films are shot 35 mil widescreen, which you people haven't been able to see this week. That's an excellent point, uh, and I fully agree with you. Yes, when we screened it in Melbourne, it was the 16 mil print that was uh, well, sent to, Mel to Melbourne, to Acme. Uh, Can I just, um, Peter, I just, and Tony, just cut in there a bit. Sure. Uh, you check the inventory at the archive, they actually had the original negative and various other, a, a range of copies. Um, so if the original negative was, was digitised and so on, it would probably look a whole lot better. What they provided to us for this this event um, was a um, an MP4 off a 16 millimeter print. So it's a used 16 millimeter print. So it clearly doesn't look its best, and it's in it's in the um, uh, it's in the ratio that 16 mil prints have. Uh, now I, they would have done that, I guess, because it was the quickest and cheapest way to um, to give us an MP4 um, to use. But clearly. Um, to do it properly, 
the uh, the original negative needs to be uh, um, properly digitised and, um, uh, and and new copies made. But uh, they've had thirty five years to do that. I mean, right. they've had thirty five years or forty years. Yes, they have. Uh, what <laughs> yeah. I'm pointing out is it is the National Film and Sound Archive, mm. and it should have a thirty five mil print or DVD of every Australian film in its proper ratio. Yeah. ready to screen to an audience wanting to discover what Australian film had, film cinema has achieved. Mm. But we can't because we're, we're saddled with these wretched 16mm prints. Yeah, I agree, Tony. Uh, but um, uh, they, they clearly don't have good 35mm copies of everything available. No, so, no. No, no. Okay. No, that, uh, hopefully the NFSA will... Uh, perhaps get better funding to be able to uh, to improve that because uh, I fully agree with you, Ray, every Australian film should be available on 35 mil and on DVD, or at least on, on uh, uh, a restored or some sort of better quality DVD so that it's uh, accessible. I mean, it's our heritage and we need to be able to uh, to access that. Just to, Tony, I just wanted to add the uh, the hacking that was done by Columbia, and you're quite right, uh, American distributors uh, tend to uh, hack uh, uh, not just Australian films, but uh, films from other countries as well. But a half hour, a full 30 minutes was taken out of uh, the 110 minute print uh, of uh, Demonstrator. And of course, what did they take out? Most of the political discussions, most of their father son arguments, what did they leave in? Well, we know. <laughs> Car chases and nudity and sex. I mean, that's really anything, the only thing that happens in Australia anyway, isn't it? So that's what they had to, <laughs> had to uh, make palatable to an audience, which, as you say, quite rightly, uh, no one went to see pretty much in America. And in Australia, it was in... Uh, yeah, go on, Tony. I, I would beg to differ. I think Columbia cut the picture for an audience that wouldn't have a clue about Australian politics. They wouldn't have even heard of Australia, let alone the politics of the country. And of course, it was a very contemporary film for its time. And therefore, it was Australian focused. I'm amazed that Columbia actually showed the film at all. <laughs> that it was out and out. Because you're looking, even though it's in the English language, it's still a foreign film to an American audience. Yep, exactly right. And, and I should also add, when the film was screened in Canberra, uh, there's an interesting story attached to that because, uh, I mean, Noel Ferry and Mike Walsh and others, uh, Malcolm Fraser, I think, uh, other luminaries attended that uh, pre worldwide premiere screening. But they had to uh, traverse a whole group of protesters to get in to see the film because it was many extras uh, who were in the film protesting that they weren't paid adequately <laughs> during the film. Uh, well, <laughs> I'd be surprised they were paid at all. <laughs> you see, I, I would guarantee you that extras would have been promised breakfast and lunch and then off. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty much... Hey. Nothing's strange, but <laughs> but I thought that was that was an interesting story about that. The um, it, it's interesting when you look at the catch cry that the students used in the film. It can't be right to unite to fight. This was their catch cry. This was the argument that they were protesting about this Southeast Asian um, alliance, um, military alliance. How remarkably prescient, though that was uh, when you consider the issues that we're having in Southeast Asia now uh, and uh, with the whole issue of militarism and uh, defense of borders and all that sort of thing. So that's why I agree with you, Tony, fully. It's, it's a muddled film. It's not a great film, uh, but it's an important film because it's oh, a, yeah. rarity, yeah. a rarity. A film doesn't have to be a masterpiece. No. It's contemporary and is saying something of the time, yep. which it was. It but was. In an inferior and unfortunate way. I mean, it, it needed a super director. Mm. Uh, rather, Warwick would have been better off handing it to a super director and be a producer. Mm. And it would have controlled the film. But um, 
when you've got the investors or the backers saying they've got the money to, you know, edit the film and pay the editor every week, when you knew they didn't. And Paul Warwick's taken away from the editing to, to concentrate on getting another hundred dollars from somebody or other. Um, it was pretty hard, uh, but um, there you are. Yes, no, absolutely right. It's interesting how David Stratton uh, dismissed the film pretty much um, as being a, a sop to the establishment. Um, yes, and, he did, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> and look, to some extent, he's right. I mean, uh, if the film is supposedly dealing with protests about militarism and, uh, and alliances like that, then the film has it uh, both ways. And so we'll introduce the protest, but then we'll make sure, although at the end of the film, we don't know exactly what the uh, conference was going to vote for. Uh, yeah. it, interesting how they left that up in the air. Um, it, it also um, uh, decided the establishment had to rule um, uh, pretty much or have its way. And of course, the son leaves at the end of the film, cap in hand, uh, knowing that he cannot deal with uh, this um, political establishment that is always going to have its way. So I, I thought that was interesting in itself, uh, especially leaving the ending up in the air. Was that always the plan, Tony, that you were aware of, or were there other endings uh, available? I'm not being facetious, but I don't think it was any plan at all. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not being commented because there was nothing else to put there. I mean, it's interesting to comment on um, David Stratton, Peter, because mm. the most exciting thing about the film was the distributor Columbia's frenzied publicity campaign. <laughs> That's bad. I don't see it as a David Stratton film. No. Mm. Yeah. Peter, if I yes. can comment on the... Uh, on the, the political content in the film. Yes. I certainly agree about the film being muddled, but it's also not only muddled, but it's also extremely vague, I thought. For instance, I found it very hard to work out two things, exactly what the, the conference was aiming to do, and furthermore, exactly what the nature of the students' protest was about. You know, because in the, in, the, in the 70s, I was thinking that, um, sex wasn't the only word on everybody's lips. I mean, the other two words that I would think of are uh, Vietnam and peace. There was a huge peace movement, and um, uh, of which, of course, students were pass, part of too. Mm. And, uh, and similarly, I mean, you're right, 70 years still, the Vietnam War is still going on. And yet there's, it's totally vague, in my opinion, what the both sides of the, were really on about. Well, I think I, I think when uh, uh, they weren't on about anything because of <laughs> Kit Denton's script, which I should add was not A4 or quarto pages, they were full scap pages of verbal diarrhea, <laughs> page after page <laughs> after page. And if you could work out whether the, who the protagonists were against who the baddies and the good goodies are, <laughs> you'd, you'd get a medal. Uh, and I remember having pages of the script out and saying to Kit, you know, where, where are we going to put this material when you do film it? But a 125-page foolscap page. Wow. Good Lord. Um, but I quite agree with you. If it had said something about the Vietnam issue, it would have been a very brave film indeed. Yes. And, of course, they wouldn't have got an American distribution, would they? Not at that time, no, absolutely right. No. But when it all boils down, and the final scene uh, says this, it's the father-son relationship that is the uh, the core of the film, not really the protest. And it, so it's the uh, the political powerhouse of uh, the defence minister versus the uh, the son who wants to try and overthrow that, or possibly overthrow it, uh, for whatever purposes, which are not clear, of course, um, really. Uh, from the outset. So, uh, yes, the, the politics of it, you, Gwenda, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is very unclear as to how it deals with the whole issue of Southeast Asia about militarism, about defence pacts, about forces, mm. and how they interrelate to one another and what this means for Australia. And yes, the Vietnam War was happening uh, overseas, but um, the film re resolutely refuses to uh, engage in that at all. 
And well, maybe, uh, and maybe I was just going to say, maybe part of that is because of the source material, uh, which uh, was a sort of a supposedly semi-futuristic look at Australia's uh, engagement with Southeast Asia, rather than uh, necessarily a much broader uh, view about the politics of the region. Maybe, but anyway, sorry, Tony. Whether we think films good or bad, or just mediocre or whatever, you've got to remember at the time the Strawberry Statement itself which is an interesting film. It only played two weeks in Sydney at the St. James Theatre and it demonstrated it got three weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> some, yeah, something was, was happening, but people weren't going to, what in Australia, they did not like contemporary cinema in that period. And that, that was, I remember being challenged by somebody, Peter, saying we were making too many period films in the early 70s. I did a count. We actually made more contemporary films, but people didn't go to them. They wanted stories, and they wanted the stories they were familiar with. So that was another thing against Strawberry Statement and Demonstrator. Yeah. The more you think about it, it, it makes Demonstrator a failed, brave film. I think that's a very fair comment. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Strawberry Statement, uh, as well as Getting Straight and uh, um, Medium Cool, uh, protest films or, or films that tried to uh, knock the establishment for what it was doing in terms of militarism and so on. At that time, audiences were very conservative. They were largely in favour of, of uh, uh, conservative audiences were largely in favour of the Vietnam War and about conflict uh, resolution, the evil communists had to be defeated, all of that sort of thing. So why go and see a film that was political um, and that dealt with issues that they might have to think about or would question some of their uh, their own philosophies or, uh, or views of the world? And I should say Strawberry Statement, which um, hopefully everyone can get a chance to see now that it is readily available now that it's been restored on Warner Archive, um, is a film starring Bruce Davidson, which has its own faults, I have to say, because I remember seeing it uh, a little while ago. And it's, it's the opposite of Warwick Freeman's uh, film because it is so flashy and, uh, and angled in so many different ways to make the whole protest movement look really uh, exciting and sexy, um, rather than having lots of sex scenes as such or anything like that that it, it was an attempt to, uh, to be more political, but failed miserably because again, it wasn't very clear by the end of the film what it was trying to say. Um, and I suppose any overtly political films, uh, even in the US at that time, would be dismissed very quickly. Um, but with Demonstrator, uh, I, I have to add, Demonstrator had a really good cast that a uh, I wish they could have worked more with, like Harold Hopkins was in it, Paul Caro, Irene Innescourt, Doreen Warburton, such really interesting people, and uh, Noel Ferry, of course, um, that, again, they were not given uh, a great deal of opportunity um, in terms of Kit Denton's script to develop their characters, um, apart from the, uh, the, the students versus the, uh, the politicians sort of angle um, of the film and the father-son relationship. Uh, Tony, did you feel the same way about that, about the actors not being particularly well used? You're touching on a very sensitive point there is the direction of the film. Yes. If you haven't, I don't think they had the money to go into two weeks of rehearsals before, which is traditional, but we went straight into it off the floor. And um, I think in fairness to those actors, they were searching at times for direction and they weren't getting it mm. because once again i come back to that question there wasn't the time on the floor for them to rehearse and rehearse and get the the, the chemistry going between the, the actors yeah and I, I think that was unfair on the cast yes once again you're doing something in six weeks we should have taken an eight week shoot mm. I agree. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear other comments and, and reflections on the film from everyone who's there, <laughs> who saw it. Well, I'm, I'm just interested to ask, uh, when Columbia showed it in the States, was it given a theat theatrical release or was it shown on TV? 
No, no, we went to a theatrical release. So yep. It was as a supporting film. The reason why the half an hour was cut out of it, it became a B film in, in the true sense of the word. Six <laughs> reels, six reels, maximum 65 minutes, uh, which befits three schools. That gives the exhibitor with an A film and a B film room to manoeuvre the scheduling of the program to show maybe two extra shorts, two newsreels and a cartoon. That's um, why the picture would have been cut to, uh, I would say 65, you said the 30 minutes was taken out? So yes, it's about 80 minutes, I think, uh, there was US release. Yeah, yeah, so it'd be a B film support. Uh, Thank you. And that would pay, sometimes a B film will get you some revenue, Liz, because the A film will be doing very well. So okay. It's not, yeah, thank you. It's not entirely a lost cause being a B film. Okay, yeah. And we know there have been some excellent uh, B films, uh, film noirs and so on, that were only, what, 70, 75 minute films that were perhaps part of a, a, a double bill, but uh, uh, stand up today as being uh, extremely uh, important and interesting films. But uh, I don't think no, I, don't that. <laughs> I grew up in the day. Mm. Sorry, I, I grew up in the days when there were two films shown. That's right. Yeah. Well, my mother, we used to go to a cinema in Crow's Nest in New South Wales called uh, the Sesqui, and the Hoyts was a bit riffraff. But if it was a blondie film on a support, we had to go. Didn't matter what the main feature was, blondie, it was, and uh, I think Penny Singleton was blondie. Anyway, the Dagwood Blondie comic strip oh, yeah, was very yeah. popular, and okay. the Blondie films were yep. always had a full house. And very often after interval, we go home at interval because Mum had seen you know, the, the supporting <laughs> feature. <laughs> uh, the good old days of the double bill, the shorts, the, the cartoons, uh, all of that's gone. But <laughs> yes, they were they were pretty much the heyday of cinema at that time. Um, one thing that uh, is a little vignette and demonstrated, which I think is brilliant, and that is a, a, at the dinner, there's a conversation between a, a Pakistani academic and, uh, and a, an Australian woman, and it's just lovely. You know? <laughs> oh, do they have, you know, universities in Pakistan, this sort of thing, and just, just the way it's played. Um, mm. It's just a very nice, um, very nice interplay between two people, and it, it, it strikes true. You know, I agree. Um, I agree we, we were just so dumb, and so, uh, <laughs> unaware of the rest of the world, you know, that it just, um, it, it sounds quite authentic. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Ray, because they, they also say in the dialogue that continues is she's asked, or is asked, um, is there still a white Australia policy? <laughs> and, <laughs> and she says, well, no, we, we don't do that anymore. We take anyone now. Mm. 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 Uh, yes, yeah, very funny. <laughs> well, it's a pity. It's a pity that the the script writers weren't as sharp as they were in that particular scene as they were in the the whole rest of the dialogue about the politics. You know, I mean, I'm not suggesting it should have been about Vietnam at all. Yeah. But I think the if they'd really talked more about what this conference was supposed to be about, you know, and then also, I mean, the students, their slogan was piss weak, in my opinion, you know, for uh, uh, what was it, this, you know, don't not to fight or something or other. But yeah. Their views are not at all uh, clear. So, you know, I think that yeah. the writing is very flawed and it could have, could have been much better. You could have done it just exactly the same. You wouldn't have without having to introduce Vietnam or something, if you'd analysed, you know, what was really going on, but it doesn't. You're absolutely right, Gwenda, because the bottom line is always the script. And yeah. you have to have a good, sharp script. You don't have to have a huge budget. You don't have to have uh, massive uh, production design or anything like that. If you've got a good story and script, then that will surmount uh, everything. And, and T Tony, I know you want to comment, but I just want to add, in that conference, it's a Southeast Asian conference. So it's uh, Asian states, Asian countries, Australia. What the hell was France, Israel, 
and other countries doing in that conference. That perpetuates the notion that the whole thing was muddled. <laughs> it makes the film international. <laughs> uh, I, I want to know amongst you all uh, whether you're detectives. According to the credits, the Pakistani diplomat that you were just referring to, Ray, that marvellous scene, um, is played by an actor by the name of Arnold Christopher, who I've never heard of and I can't find any record of. But I peer at the Pakistani and I think that's Kit Denton. I think it's Kit Denton in a cameo role. Okay. Oh, well, well. I'm working on it because he looks a spitting image of Kit. He didn't have a beard, but Pakistani does. And I can't remember ah. any actor called Arnold Christopher. And I'm pretty sure it is Kit Denton playing a cameo under a pseudonym. What a great observation. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we also found that scene with Kit Denton, maybe, or the, the Pakistani man and the Australian woman, uh, a real highlight of the film. And I sort of thought it was just like a bit of Shakespeare, really, where, you know, it uses comedy to comment in a very profound way on, on the film. And I think the film, rather than being about fathers and sons and sex and car chases and <laughs> demonstrations, is really about race and Australia's changing at that time of the white Australia policy disappearing. And I think that's the interesting thing. And in that context, it's really a really, really good thing of the, about the film is that it has a genuine Asian actor in a major part. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that was probably pretty amazing for that time for an Australian made film. Yes, that really yeah. struck me. That was the first thing that hit me. So, oh my goodness, this long ago, there was a genuinely Asian face. I've just been so used to films with really clumsy yellow face. And here we are like 50 years later or 49 years later last year, everyone was so excited that Crazy Rich Asians was a film sort of led by um, an Asian cast. And so, it's taken, it was uh, quite a leader in that way. I'm not saying the film was good. It was no. quite, you know. Patchy. Uh, very patchy and muddled. <laughs> <laughs> but for us, that, both that scene, but also that general thing um, with um, that actor in particular and perhaps some of the other actors at the conference was, was quite groundbreaking, I think. But was it, there's an interesting interplay, I think, in the, at, at the dinner. Um, Slim de Grey is the Prime Minister makes his speech and he he, um, he says, we Asians, you know, we're, and, and he said, I'd say that advisedly or something like that. He and much later in the yeah. film, Kenneth right. Tang picks up on um, the fact that this was a conference uh, about what Asians do being organized by Australia, by a white country, you know, and that's a quite, I mean, they, they, they kind of bookend the argument. Um, because here's, here's, here's Australia, a small country, he says, uh, in population, basically orchestrating what all the Asian countries are going to do. Xi Jinping would have something to say about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although I found it... I, I, sorry. I, sorry, no, go, go ahead. I was just going to say that, that statement by Slim de Grey is very Keating-esque, really. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's just so interesting that Kenneth saying it's never clear which country he actually represents. Yeah, and I thought uh, initially when I first watched it, I was trying to guess which uh, country he represented, and I came down in favour of Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, me too. I did too. I did too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that, that you but could well be right. It was clearly and purposefully ambiguous, but yeah, you could try and work something out. Yeah. Mm. I was going to say, I'm in the UK, and you're talking. You were talking about the um, US release. Um, I can tell you about the UK release. It didn't have one. Um, oh. <laughs> the best of my, as far as I'm tell it's on my list of um 1970s australian films that have never been shown at all in the uk it's not, not been on tv not been commercially released not even been shown at the national film theater so 
Yeah, this is literally the first opportunity I've ever had to see this film. So. Uh, uh, that's good. Um, the uh, poster for the film is on eBay at the moment at eight dollars <laughs> fifty. <laughs> uh, I have to confess this morning I was very tempted. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I remember the clue that made us think it was Vietnam. He talked about Agent Orange. Yes, and yes. Equalization and all of that stuff. Yeah. Ah, yes. And yes. Napalm, yes. Yes, yes. Good pick up. Yeah. Yeah. Where does, where does that come in, Jill? Oh, there was a conversation. I think he was having it with, um, oh, the woman. I've forgotten her name. His love interest. Oh, yeah. I was talking to her about it, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. We should mention her. Wendy Lingham, I think, isn't it? Uh, was his love interest? Or, or was that the... Uh, no, that's the son's love interest, uh, Wendy Lingham. Same, same person. Yes. Wendy, oh, same Wendy. person, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, interesting, she's an Australian actress who uh, uh, was an expat living in London who was uh, asked to come back to Australia to... Uh, appear in the film um but yeah did, did you like that yeah. elongated sex scene between her and uh, kenneth sang oh, it, it I was very <laughs> understated it was a, a refreshing overstated a refreshing understatement. change from too much information <laughs> Real. But I like, of, I, I like the set, which was a bit like a Greek temple, you know. It was yeah. allegedly a motel bedroom, I guess. It's yes. set up more like a Greek temple. I think that was shot in a Sydney studio, but... <laughs> right. It, it was the second funniest scene in the film. <laughs> was it a case of trying to second guess how, how far the censor would allow you to go? Yes. Uh, compared to our similar films, uh, similar scenes in similar films around the same time. Yes. Same yes. as the language. There wasn't any very strong language in it either. Tony, speaking of that sex scene, I'm interested in the way you edited that because it did go on a fair bit. And I was wondering whether you did that deliberately because you thought it was needed in the film. <laughs> Call that editing. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, well, um, I'm so glad it entertained you. Uh, I mean, you couldn't do anything with it. It was just the same <laughs> boot shot with a camera in a different position. <laughs> At least the camera got into position, however. <laughs> so to speak. And, and, uh, and, and you must have had fun editing the poolside uh, orgy uh, scenes. That must have been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Yes, I think I looked at the rushes and thought, God, what do I do with this? Um, uh, it's not that good, is it? I mean, <laughs> it's interesting, but it, it picks up on Gary's point about how far you would go in terms of nudity that would be acceptable. Oh, I see. Yeah. At that time. Yes. Well, you've got to remember, we, in Australia and England, you saw the real Helen Mirren naked. In America, you didn't. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Although that the film was released, by, yeah. Anyway, go on. I was amazed by this 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 elaborate. Well, it's not actually a car chase, is it? It's, I mean, <laughs> call a chase when nobody's chasing them, where they're just <laughs> running hell for leather, you know, into nowhere and smashing up, and and one of them even rolls and burns. But then there was no further discussion about it. It's not mentioned. <laughs> You know, no. It was just, just like a, just an insert, you know, an insert, yeah. a dramatic effect. It was, it was to wake. It was actually put in there to wake you up. Oh right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I mean, there were a bunch of really different stylistic things in the film that didn't hang together, like the car chase, the sex scene, and then the um, the kindergarten. Um, wafty oh, yeah. thing at the end. They were like totally different filmic styles clunked together with, with, without any real rationale. Clunked together. I think <laughs> Can I use that expression, uh, Bruce, uh, in chapter one day? Clunked together. <laughs> there have been many scenes 
that I've clunked together. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, can you talk about that final credit sequence where, of course, the theme song or the main song had to be played about the future and hope and children playing and all that sort of thing? Was that always going to be part of the, the uh, final credit sequence or was it uh, going to be something else? It was, oh, well, I don't think it was meant to be anything else. <laughs> Um, no, there were no end credits scenes and suddenly that came like a bolt out of the blue one Saturday afternoon and John McLean had to shoot it. Um, it was, I, there was some peculiar credits there too at the same time. But no, I, I don't know. We just came out of nowhere. Uh, mainly because we just had white titles on black background. And uh, we all thought that was pretty boring. <laughs> but whether the kindergarten scene, I don't know. Maybe it's the meant to be in the future. Maybe the future. Yes. Yeah. 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 yes. I thought well, the oh. Yeah, no, it's too gone. I thought the scene where uh, the students infiltrated the Albert Hall was terrific and moved along really well. I, you know, I thought, oh, I can see you hiding there. And uh, do you remember that? I thought, and given the fact that you said that there was so little rehearsal time or none, that just seemed to go very well. I think you've, uh, it's flying by the seat of your pants. You, you have two mm. camera coverage and you get, grab what you can. Somebody coming down out of the ceiling on a rope, etc. And uh, it was a wild, what do you call a wild shoot? Mm. I agree with Sue. I think that was done very well. The way that the, mm. fact, the way they uh, they infiltrated by you know grabbing the furniture and just walking <laughs> in, you know, as though they were part of the uh, the crew setting up crew. I, that was done well. I thought very well. Yeah. But but it seemed odd in itself that a CTC seven uh, television would be covering. These, this uh, dinner, this banquet, which was not actually the conference. Uh, and and uh, of course, then the mayhem uh, luckily uh, happens for them, I suppose. But uh, uh, I suppose because CTC7, where uh, if we go back to David Bryce, that's, uh, that's where he was working. Uh, they were sort of part of the, uh, the film itself. Mm. I think they had to have reasonable coverage somehow that, that you know to be inserted in the film, but it, I, I, I like the um, uh, the dinner scene and the little, and the little touches in it, um, such as when um, somebody walks past with a with a, a tray of drinks, and the two waiters sort of grab one each, and uh, these yeah. are just sort of sort of throwaway things that look that that make it look real, you know. Um, so at, uh, even though as Tony says it was. Um, you know, there was two cameras, and you and you you got what you could. Um, I, it, it, those little things came together and made it made it work as a scene. I think. Yes, I was hoping they would go back to the nineteen sixty eight film, The Party, and uh, and really oh. go to town on that. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> have an elephant though. Yeah, <laughs> but it wouldn't allow. <laughs> So uh, will this mean, now that th there is a, a fair bit of interest in the film, I have to say, uh, mm. forget about the, the, the worth of it, it's an important film in terms of the politics and so on, is, is perhaps something going to happen that it gets better um, uh, eyeballs, if you like, uh, audiences or coverage or NFSA perhaps will now deal with it better in a better way and release a better print of it? it because I think, as we've been saying all along, um, it's our Australian film heritage and we need to preserve it as much as possible. Mm. I would recommend to Jan Muller that a review be done of the archives collection and see what they've got and what they haven't got and then prepare maybe a 10 year program because it costs money to faithfully restore every film feature film made in the country, whether it be a bad film or a good film, they're important to the culture of film in this country and, and its history. Uh, I can't see anyone tomorrow morning rushing into the archive and saying, oh, we've got a restore demonstrator, but I think it should be on a list of films and they should look into uh, making these films accessible because they're restoring for the time of his national life again now, 
they restored the sentimental bloke last year, but you can't access them. You can't even buy them. So what's the point of restoring? That's my question. Yeah. You, every high school library should have a DVD of an Australian film housed in the archive. It's a long way from happening, but I think the yarn has been here now three and a half years. Mm. And I think we're about to get a new chair and some new board members. And I think they should collectively get together and say, we're going to work out what our strategy is for the next 10 years and make sure that every Australian film that they've got is accessible. Will the NFSA have access to this discussion so that they know that uh, we've been discussing this? It's being recorded. Yeah. Do they get a copy? Will they get a copy of the uh, yeah. this? Uh, they'll have access. It's this being recorded, so they'll have access to it. Right. And I'll point that out to Jan. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, one of the questions I have is I don't know how they organise their internal priorities. That's not really made public. Yeah. Um, they do. They have received um, an extra allocation. Their funding, by the way, is being like all the institutions are being cut every year. Okay, yeah. it's backwards. They have been given a, um, a, a certain amount of money for four years to do digitisation. I don't know what that covers, how widely, it, how widely it's covered. Um, but um, at some point, they will need to be sure that all the original um, film material, all the original negatives are digitised um, over a number of years. They do have a program called NFSA Restores, and they do restore particular films, but mm. it's, it's, it's one at a time. Yeah. It's not a deluge of stuff. And uh, and then they have the issue of how accessible is it? Well, I think they're trying to um, get commercial mileage out of some of these things, so they're not readily necessarily readily available unless you pay for them. Um, in well, order to... Think, uh, not available on DVD, I, don't, a lot of them. I don't think anybody's looking for anything for nothing. No, mm. I know. When, you know, you've got to pay. Hmm. But I mean, so... You, it, the public are wanting these things. Hmm. You cannot tell me or convince me that hiding them away in a vault is, a, is being able to access them. No, it's not. No, uh, it's and not. and uh, that's my complaint. Hmm. I want to see the work, like the sound department, the sound history, uh, this week got marvellous coverage on the news bulletins. It did, yes. And yeah. it was terrific to see that sound was being, like, re reminded of our oral and, and sound history. Hmm. Um, but is it accessible? That's the thing I... Yes, you can go on the website and play it, but you want to be able to buy it if you want to. Yep, yep. Just, uh, just concerning the uh, interest in Canberra, um, I'm just going to share with you in our picture of the Q&A when the friends showed it. This is in the theatreette. So we had a we had a, a good turn up in Canberra to, to see the film. Yeah, in fact, it was um, more than a full house, and we had to send some people away. Yes, so, um, there was enormous local interest in Canberra. Uh, about the film and of course a number of the people in that picture were actually in the film as extras uh they came all, there. When, yeah. when you look at this audience here it's all the more reason that they should mm. be able to go out and buy the disc at the counter that's on right the home. yeah that, look at it i had a full house four years ago for the presentation i did mm. and then you've got a good house and you're showing a lousy 16 millimeter print mm. like, Unforgivable. Yeah. Agree, Tony. Well, when you consider in, in Europe, in uh, Germany, Austria, uh, and a number of other countries, and the US as well, they uh, routinely restore most of their films uh, and make them accessible. You can go and buy DVDs, Blu rays of the films, as well as lots of extras related to the making of those films and so on. So they make sure that those films are accessible. And in Australia, we seem to be hiding them away, as you say quite rightly, Tony, and everyone else, that um, we need to see them because for research purposes, to understand our culture, to understand our historical and social development over the years, film in particular is so important um, in, in terms of uh, accessing that and being able to understand and discuss it in some detail. 
Uh, Lisa just asked, do we know what um, uh, what they're working on now? Uh, no, I don't. I've actually asked Jan for a list of what they're what they are working on now, um, but I, I don't know the answer to that question. So, uh, as Tony mentioned, they recently redid the centre metal bloke um, to uh, open the um, the uh, the Melbourne chapter of the Friends last year. Uh, we saw. Um, my, yeah, my brilliant career. My brilliant career. Yeah. Um, so they've they've done some seventies features. Mm -hmm. uh, and but I'm not I'm not sure exactly what they're working on now. They, they have restored the Cheetahs, um, 99 McDonough film. Um, not sure what else there is, but the uh, but as I said, these these appear one at a time. It's not a flood, um, and it's a, it's it's a very small number compared to what's what's even coming to the collection now. Mm. So uh, it's it's not happening near near fast enough. I don't know. Um, whether that's a question of money, um, internal priorities, or whatever, but uh, the NPSA now has, um, I think, a, a full full time staff equivalent of about 165 people, 170 people. Um, that's less than it was a few years ago, and that's because of these um, what are called efficiency dividends being cut all over the place, and the um, contradiction in all of this. And one of the issues that the friends taken up this year is the half billion dollars being spent on the Australian War Memorial Extension, mm. which uh, is, is widely opposed, which they'll probably go ahead with anyway. Mm. They can find money for that. And they can find large amounts of money for pork barrelling and all the rest of it. Uh, but they are cutting uh, significantly. They're cutting cultural institutions, the ABC, uh, the Auditor General's office, you know, it all yep. goes in a particular direction. So, um, uh, clearly, they've got plenty of money to spend if they want to spend on something lavishly. Um, uh, five hundred million, five hundred, yeah, five hundred million dollars on anything is a vast amount of money. Um, the uh, the archives budget, annual budget, is something um, or the order I think about twenty four, twenty five million a year, <clears throat> which covers everything, staff, the lot, um, and you're going to do so much with that. So, yeah, so. Um, mm. Uh, Thank it, you. Thanks yeah, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Just, if, if you can indulge me for a moment, Tony, while we have you there, I think it's very appropriate for you, if you want to, to discuss editing Wake in Fright, because that is such an important Australian film, as such a great Australian film. And uh, obviously the contrast with Demonstrator is immense, but can you talk about some aspects of the editing process, working with the director and, uh, and uh, really making this such an important and brilliant film? Um, thank you. Um, you have to uh, go onto my website and buy my book. There's a whole chapter on the editing of Wake and Fry and how I edited it from Ed's notes. Um, it was a very successful collaborative uh, effort between Ted Kotcheff, the director, and me. I would cut the sequence one way and he'd say, well, why don't we do this? And I'd do it and then I'd get another idea and then he'd get another idea. So it was, it was a very successful and very happy experience. It was where I realised what a producer does and doesn't do, and how why one night on the way home from editing the kangaroo hunt, uh, which took about a week to get right, um, I saw the book Caddy in the news agents, and 4 a.m. the next morning I finished reading it. I realised that Ted didn't have, there was a plethora of producers on the credits, but he didn't have a producer at all. There wasn't a producer on Wake and Pride. The, the, George Willoughby was the importer and he didn't think I could edit and didn't think we were very good. Remember this, Wake and Fright was edited on a black and white work print. We never saw it in colour until we got the first print. So it was amazing, it was as good as it is. Um, so I thought I must become a producer because I knew I wouldn't be able to direct my way out of a brown paper bag. So editing suited me because I was already an editor. But, uh, but to be a producer, I thought, no, this is something that's got to be done because Ted needed backup. 
And uh, even then, I think it was Tom Noble, who a great British film editor, was asked to look at the cut of Wake and Bright when it arrived in London. And uh, they said, now, what, what can you do to improve it? And the first thing Tom said to me, he said, well, first of all, I can't do anything to improve it. He said, what are you worried about? See, there this, 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 was this, you know, inferior thing we couldn't, you know, being straight and down under, couldn't do anything. We did. Uh, and, 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 and then when it came to the sound mixing, which we still had to put up with being done in England, they had to send the picture back to us because they couldn't do the kangaroo hunt and get the vehicle sounds. So we did all the sound editing in Australia and then sent it back to London for the picture to be mixed. Um, but it's uh, one of the most successful, well, one of the most, the happiest films I've ever edited. And that's the sound, that's a strange very thing to say when the picture is so brutal. But um, there we are. Mm. That is so interesting. And I mean, the role of the editor is sometimes not that well understood or acknowledged. And uh, I mean, of course, Jill Bilcock uh, has been uh, acknowledged uh, with her brilliant editing work, but the role of the editor really is to uh, remake the film, to, so to speak, to, to take everything that, that's been shot and to make it into something that uh, is palatable, but also in collaboration where possible with the director to make the, uh, the artistic achievement. So, Tony, I can see that working with Ted Kotcheff, of course, was uh, quite a good experience for you. Well, and also working with Michael Powell, because I, I met, I, twice on Michael Powell's picture, my, uh, Age of Consent, you do, not need to, uh, do you not need a cutaway shot here? He said, you won't need it. And when you got down to the editing, he was right, he didn't need it. Um, um, but there's a big difference, Peter, between editing and cutting. Mm. And a lot of pictures I look at now are cut because they're on impossible schedules. Before COVID-19, the release date of a picture was announced long before the picture was even started shooting. And then the cutting has to start. And so consequently, you'll see three or four editors' names on a picture. And they've all had to do a real each. And there's no symmetry in the cutting at all. It's just edited in a very rough way. Um, so there is a difference between editing and cutting. Yeah. And unfortunately, for my taste, there's too much cutting going on. But uh, one of the things that annoys me, see, Jill Bilcock is a great editor. Yeah. yeah. And she deserves a film editor's credit. But they always say edited by. Why does it say edited by when it says director of photography, production designer? Why does it have to say edited? Why can't it say film editor? Fair point. <laughs> I've said enough for today. I'll say good afternoon. <laughs> All right. Have we uh, exhausted uh, demonstrator? <laughs> <laughs> we are over our uh, allotted time, so... Um... Ah. Okay, we uh, are now into the second hour, um, so we probably should uh, draw it to a, a close soon. Um, I, I, it's been um, fascinating. <laughs> it really has. Um, uh, and we've got some politics got... into it too. What's that? <laughs> and, we've, and we've got some politics into it too. Yes. <laughs> so look, um, uh, Peter, is anything, anything else you want to sort of raise or... Um, no, but I think I've got to go, actually. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, thank thanks, you. Tony. Joining in, Tony. Oh, golly, this has been useful. Um, <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> Buy the book, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, recommend, I recommend the book. I really do. Tony's um, biography. Behind, and, behind, and, behind a Velvet Light Trap. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, Tony, many, how many of you remember going through the Velvet Light Trap? The, the velvet, velvet one? The Velvet Light Trap. I've heard of it. You all, there used to be in every cinema, you used to go through the Velvet Light Trap and the usherette would probably open the door of the curtain for you. Uh, uh. Uh -huh. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can remember it. <laughs> 
Okay, no, I, I don't. Yeah. So, Tony, when will there be a film adaptation of your book? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> God, God help us all. <laughs> Make a great documentary, though, I must say. Actually, it would. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, when you look back at what I've had the good fortune to be able to edit, Mm. I always make my own documentaries in between times. Uh, it's yes. a in collection. Uh, you know, from demonstrated to Don Quixote. <laughs> Good heavens. You have uh, produced some great stuff, I must say. And, uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for having me at your place this afternoon. Thank you for joining in, Tony. And, and also thank you, Peter, uh, for preparing it and, and so on. So uh, maybe with that, we can say good afternoon. Um, could, I, could I just say thank you very much for, uh, as a Melbourne member, thank you very much for everything this year. I've really appreciated it, and especially being able to see all the films, and um, none of which I had seen before, so it's been fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Great. That's great, Liz. And I, and I hope it can, long may it last. I mean, I yeah. hope this will continue <laughs> as a member for yeah. the uh, NFSA. It's very frustrating to get the uh, events in Canberra yeah. that one can't go yeah. to. Yeah. It's very frustrating. Uh, so this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, presumably events in Melbourne will restart in physical terms in the new year, hopefully. Yeah, right. okay. um, uh, and uh, But we hope to continue webinars like this, which we can good. all join in, no matter where we are. Yeah, that's good. I yeah. think it's a great a great upside of the pandemic. Yes. yes. So we've yes. all learned how to do it. it, is. Yeah. it is. Yes. So, look, thank you all for joining in this afternoon. And... Um, uh, and if this is being recorded, we'll, we'll make it known where you can access this recording if you want to revisit it. And I'll pass that link on to Jan Muller. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ray. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Gwenda. It's been a pleasure. Thank I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. And everybody. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Yes. And Merry Christmas. We're going to be able to get together at Christmas. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm off. I'm off. Goodbye all.